to the show with your friend and mine. So tell me, Dr. Squee, who's it gonna be this time? We like to hear you talk, and we love to hear you listen. And if you are not subscribed, you won't know what you're missing. So welcome to the Dr. Squee Show. Welcome to the Dr. Squee Show. Welcome to the Dr. Squee Show. Headphones up. Hello and welcome back to the Dr. Squee show. I'm Dr. Squee and this here is my show. Uh, doing a double tonight. This is our second interview of the night. Uh, we're now welcoming a filmmaker whose new film, A Day to Die, stars Bruce Willis. This exciting action film sees an ex-military officer having one day to get two million in reparations to a local gang leader to secure the release of his kidnapped wife. Also starring Kevin Dillon and Frank Grillo. Please welcome to the Dr. Squee show. Wes Miller. Hey, Wes. thanks for having me. How are you doing tonight? I'm or great, today? man. I'm great. Tonight, today, you know. Whatever right. may be in your given time zone. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Which I was just to explain. By the way, anyone who was expecting to be tuning into this in now's time, I do apologize, but America changed their time zones an hour a week out from when the UK does it next weekend. So yeah. thank you for tuning in if you got this live. If not, it's on video. It'll be out there. It's fine. Um the poster for, for the new film, uh, Day to Day, there sounds absolutely amazing. And I do want to get onto it. Before we do that, I'm going to go a little bit off piece from what I ask you first. Only because okay. I saw a news clip and it just kind of like incensed me. And I kind of got you, I, I wanted to get your opinion on this. Okay. So uh, the BAFTAs was just recently here in the UK. Mm -hmm. And uh, this news sto story was uh, lauding the fact that because a Latino woman had won an Oscar, or sorry, won a B BAFTA, the West Side Story, they've tackled their diversity issue. <laughs> now, to me, I think that falls a little bit short in 2022, giving one Latina actress a BAFTA to say that you you kind of sorted out diversity. As a proud black filmmaker, um, like, how do you think it's going? <laughs> you know, I mean, it's a very complex question. I, I think your initial response your feeling on it is 100 percent correct like you don't reverse hundreds of years of um, discriminatory practices either intentional or negligent you know with one you know uh award per se um especially when there's been so many qualified you know performers like way before now and you know just so thankfully they actually recognized her her wonderful work um, but yeah, we, and, and there has been a lot of change, um, a lot of, there has been change. So we're not where we were 30 years ago, um, but there's still a lot of change needed. And, you know, the fact that we're having to quote unquote, celebrate the first in 2022 is really concerning. Um, again, with, because we've had so many wonderful performers, you know, either from, you know, the UK or from the United States and, you know, foreign films and, uh, you know, it's it's just a uh, it's it's disheartening and encouraging all at the same time. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. I know I put you on the spot with that one. I just saw it just before we went on. I'm like, no, just no, please, please, <laughs> please don't say that. <laughs> we yeah, get, we and, and start, you know, but... I, I, and it won't change, man, until the heads of the networks and the studios and the people who are financing films, you know, until until diversity reaches those levels and it's not just a cool thing to say, but a, a real practice that's taking place and, a and, and an acknowledgement that all people, de despite where you come from and the color of your skin can contribute to the arts, um, until they're seen on those highest levels, we're, we're always going to still be celebrating these quote unquote first and seconds for hopefully not another hundred years, but definitely for a while to come. Uh, and getting back to yourself, sir. So again, thank you very much for, for indulging me on that one. I did, yeah, yeah. Mm, <laughs> it burned just a little bit watching that. <laughs> but for you, sir, uh, it seems like you're someone whose uh, star is currently in the ascendancy with your last film, uh, Ron Perlman in Western, and now you've mm -hmm. got this wonderful action film with Bruce Willis. Uh, how's it been that kind of like, uh, you seem to have gone quite a roller coaster ride over the last few years um, with your career. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's been a fun journey. Um, you know, again, it's just beginning for me. You know, I came, started with uh, full-time full filmmaking like in 2015. 
And, you know, I, I love it. It's hard. It's extremely hard. Um, but like being able to work with talented people like the, the Bruce and the Leon and the Grillo and Kevin Dillon and Ron Perlman and David Jesse from, you know, actually over in the UK, Tay and George, like all, all, all of my collaborators um, ha has just been really wonderful. It's, you know, they've helped me grow and, you know, it's been humbling that they actually trust me you know, with, with pieces of their career. And, you know, I've just always worked to continue to get better in the craft and deliver. And yeah, really excited about um, Day to Die, you know, it's a cool little action film. Yeah, I mean, it seems like uh, at the moment there would be loads of opportunities opening up for yourself. What was it about this story which seemed like the one to tell right now? So um, when I got the screenplay, you know, my, the goal was, it was, you know, I kind of, it felt like it was okay, but you know, the plot, you know, kidnapping, $2 million, you know, time, you know, it, you know, we've, we've seen it. So the, my goal was, is like, I had to think about myself in a career. What do I want to, what kind of filmmaker do I want to be? Um, and ultimately, um, Leon actually helped me uh, formulate this, um, the actor Leon, but it was um, a, a filmmaker who makes socially relevant action movies. You know, I want, I want something that appeals to a mass audience because, you know, we do this work and we want people to see it. Um, at the same time, I do the work because I enjoy making entertaining, you know, and and, you know, have, you know, something to say. But and at the same time, you know, you got to make it entertaining. So financiers will finance your work. Um, and so, you know, looking at that, I was like, OK, let, let me see how can I infuse a little bit more of myself? What can I do to bring, you know, something unique to it and to, you know, quote unquote, elevate it a little bit? And and then that's when I went and did the work and developed the character that Leon plays. And, you know, just just added, you know, a, a, a few socially relevant links, uh, metaphor, so to speak, you know, that just hopefully while you're on this fun ride, you you're getting a little bit more into it as well. And uh, Frank Grillo, he was in uh, the Western, which you did, sorry, uh, Hell on mm -hmm. the Border. Yeah. And you chose him for like the lead in this film. What was it about him that, that seemed right for this one? So, I mean, Frank is like the consummate professional, like he has a, a intensity on screen that is just like literally unmatched. And we, we hit it off on Hell on the Border. And like, he's just like, he's just good. You know what I mean? Like when, and, and he's helpful and, and like, you know, again, like I, I, you know, we became friends off of that one. And then, so when I was thinking of the leader of this group and I knew what his, you know, his ultimate fate was going to be in the film, I felt like I wanted somebody who had that intensity of strength, um, but also had the ability to be vulnerable um, that would allow the audience into their psyche just a little bit. And so that, you know, they, they care about this character. So whenever what happens to them, you know, towards, you know, in the film, they're like right there with them and empathizing with them. And I just felt like he had all those qualities and uh, he signed on early. Um, we were supposed to do this before COVID hit, but then when COVID hit, we had to like, you know, like everybody else, just kind of shelve it until things got safe. And uh, so he stayed on board with us. And you've got Bruce Willis in an action film. Not really. He's He seems to be playing more the kind of police uh, chief role. Mm -hmm. Is there any pressure when you've got Bruce Willis on the set and you're doing an action film? Like, is he going, no, oh, I don't think so. Yeah, maybe not that way. <laughs> um, you know, I, and by the time he comes on set, you know, he's already dialed in to the to the material pretty well. So yeah. you don't, you know, it, it is, I mean, you try not to fanboy out because you're like, man, that's like Bruce Willis standing over there. Um, so you, you take that in for like 30 seconds and then you, you know, you get your wits about yourself and, you know, you go, you go do the work. But no, he was great, man. Like him and his team, they were wonderful. Uh, and, you know, I know Bruce gets a lot of flack because he's working a lot now, um, which, you know, he's working a lot because people like watching him, watching him. So um yeah. you know so the you know the thing for us was you know we knew bruce was going to be in the movie we knew people would want us there is a subset of people that would consider it a bruce movie um but this is you know a really ensemble piece with a lot of wonderful actors and uh you know and when people um outside of the let's see what bruce is doing next camp watch it um you know we're getting really wonderful responses and, uh, and it really makes me happy you know well i will, I will get all the the bruce bruce 
uh, fanboy questions out of the way first because like uh, i mean i mean he's he'll just always be john mcclain john mcclain sorry not john mcclain. that's a very different person don mcclain but he'll always be john mcclain if not uh the guy from uh from moonlighting back in the day i'm, I'm sure. old enough to remember yeah. but i mean th the one thing which you do here is some directors seem to have for whatever reason and it's not many has got your question just some uh filmmakers don't seem to have gotten well with bruce uh, how did you find working with them and how is there a way of working with a big presence such as him or do you just treat it like you know it's just the work and get on with it yeah you, you treat it like the work and I think the the thing is it's like actors at that level are they, they know they could be intimidating and as a director you're either going to be intimidated and let them you know and not direct them or you're going to give them what they really want, which is a firm direction, not firm meaning mean, but they want to know that you, you know what the objective of the scene is. They want to know that you know um, what you're going for when you're shooting. You're not just shooting 100 shots just to be shooting 100 shots. Um, and, and that's it. And it just really goes back to being prepared as a director and coming in, letting the talent know that you're prepared and that you're ready and you're going to do everything in your power to you know get a, a great performance. And the other part is this. It's like, you have to trust your collaborators. And so like a lot of times when we would begin our scenes, you know, we, we take the script, we walk it out, we talk it out, we block it out. If something's not working, we cross it out. And then we, uh, you know, replace it with what's working or can we sell it with a look? And then you, you, you dial into the scene and then once you, you find the rhythm, camera's up. And so uh, you're, you're getting the work in. So it's just like, got to go. And like it, it seems like these are bigger and bigger and more ambitious films you're doing, but uh, maybe still on a kind of tighter budget. How do you produce action on a tight budget? Because it doesn't seem to compromise. Uh, we've only been provided with the trailer so far, but it uh, doesn't seem to compromise on the action to, for the budget. How do you make that compromise? Yeah, I, there's two pieces of that. One, technology has really leveraged, you know, the accessibility to make cinematic images. Um, so we use three 6K cameras on this one uh, from this company called Zcam. Um, Chris McCrory is using them on Mission Impossible, and um, um, Juan Car Wise used them on is using them on Blossoms. It's like a really um, new tool that you know is breaking through the ecosystem of like the heavy red and heavy area Alexa. And, you know, so I, I love those cameras. So I was able to use three 6K cameras, which allowed us to get great coverage, plus have the ability to punch in as needed on, on certain shots. Then the other part of that is realizing that when you're shooting, um, you know, if you don't have a big budget, no, you can't stage and do like the huge master shots of it like five different times. You know what I mean? You're like you got you got to be selective. And, and showing what you shoot and just making sure that every frame that you utilize is, is full. Um, and so I looked at a lot of like Peter Berg's work. I looked at, um, you know, some of the earlier Jason Bourne work and, you know, I just kind of really studied the frames and it's just like, okay, like what makes this feel big? What makes this feel small? Um, and these were guys that, you know, that use the, the handheld aesthetic, you know, very effectively. So, and uh, yeah, and Paul Greengrass, like he's just, you know, a master at it. So, you know, I was just like, look, like what makes it feel big? What makes it feel small? And then you go in through preparation and just like get your shot list together. Make sure when the frame goes up, everything that you need to fill the frame to make it feel big is fill it. Trust your shot list once you've done it, when you don't have that, like, because when you're doing your shot list, you don't have the pressure of like, I got to go, 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 go. You've had a chance to think it through. Trust that shot list. If you want to get a couple of extra shots, great. But once you get that shot list, move on to the next one because you like you don't really have a lot of time. So that really helped. Um, and yeah, and, and that was it. And then the performers, you know, their faces like, you know, we we love their faces like that's why we watch. So, you know, using um, specific times to go into the close ups to, to bring the audience into the emotion. Uh, actually helps it feel, you know, a lot bigger as well. So that was it, you know, just a lot of planning, realizing, you know, how, you know, coming up with a strategy to fill the frames to make them feel as full as possible, um, being selective when we do pull out for like wider shots. And yeah, and that was it. And is there a particular action scene we should look out for? One like you were really proud when you, uh, when it all came together? Man, you know, I, I, there are a few, like, I'm really proud of all of them. My stunt team was amazing. My special effects team was amazing. My armorer team was amazing. Like, 
we were able to pull together some really big feeling, you know, action sequences. Um, so I don't think one necessarily trumps the other. I'm really proud of the, they have a, there's a huge gunfight, you know, at the end, um, like towards the end, but then there's some emotional action beats like at the beginning, you know? Yeah. I mean, so we, we try to give the audience a little bit of everything to, uh, to, to have fun with along this ride. And especially kind of in the times just after the uh, tragic incident on Rust with Alec Baldwin, uh, mm. how do you ensure safety and uh, like still work at a great pace when you're doing something like this? I mean, great question. Um, so we shot this before Rust, you know, just happened, you know, um, like we shot in March, or April last year. And what Rust was like, what, August sometime, September? Um, what happened on Rust is such a tragedy and so many different stories um safety checks were missed in order for that tragedy to happen and i think like for us having a qualified armorer was just like key um eric petaway and his wife adrian you know he's a former u.s marshal or not former he's a current u.s marshal and you know he's just a plus so like for us no matter how fast we're moving um gun safety was not compromised you know so once clips are emptied you know the armor is supposed to come you know finger comes off the trigger armor comes to get the weapon and you know i'm normally like really close to my actors just because like um that's kind of school i come from it's like i want to be close to my actors in the in the fray as much as possible next to camera close to them so like when they were like when guns would get like soon as the last you know it hits and i got cut i'm like where's eric he'd be like literally like i'm right here boss like literally like right here next to me ready to jump in when i say go um and, and yeah, and, you know, we take the time to check. Everybody checks the, the um, cylinders before, you know, any cold weapons are, are, are moved around at all. Um, you know, certain the specific number of, of rounds are put into a magazine. We know how many there are. That's how many get shot. When you stop, you stop. And it's just really following there's And that's just very high level, just like, you know, quick observations. But there's a specific protocol that's in place before guns get to actors. Um, and then when actors utilize them, and then when they finish discharging them, there's a protocol to keep everything safe and secure and, you know, under lock and key and behind like iron bars. So nobody gets to them. I mean, you know, if you follow safety rules like that have been designed, you know, for years now, like, you know, using practical weapons is really safe. Yeah, and uh, thank you for keeping it safe for all your actors. It, um, <laughs> as a film lover, you want you want that to be the case, of course. Uh, yeah, man. And, and, you know, there's just something about practical weapons that, like, you know, for maybe like one or two gunshots, maybe go on CGI. But if you have a full-out gun fight, fight scene and you're just only going CGI, it's hard to replicate that same energy and feel and, and, and you know, even energy. I mean, because there is a, a sense of danger with any real and weight with any, with your gun in your hand, like your, your body just feels it. Um, and so, yeah, but you just don't do it for the, you know, the sacrifice and safety in doing it. I mean, obviously it's less deadly, but like, it just annoys me that something in most films and TV shows, when they treat coffee cups, they're doing all this, like, and that's meant to have hot coffee in it. That's one let, of my let, pet peeves, man. I'm like, man, if you don't put some liquid in that cup, man, like I can tell it's floating around there. Just put some water in there. That's all yeah, you got to do. You don't have to have man. scalding coffee. Yeah. Yep, exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, I mean, it does seem for something which was, like you say, an avoidable tragedy, uh, it would be a shame for filmmaking to suffer when just all it needs to be followed is, is safety procedures. Correct, yeah. And and if, if you follow those, there are like four or five places that if, if there was a round that shouldn't have been in there, um you, you would have seen it especially on that rehearsal um but like you know I, I wasn't there so i don't know like how the ammunition was kept if it was co-mingled if it wasn't but like i just know on our sets every everything was segregated from everybody and there was only literally like one or two people that had access to it, and that was our armor and assistant armor um and i would be like a backup if i needed to hold something um while like they're unloading somebody else's gun uh, you know, so you just keep it with a small circle of people with a responsibility. Ultimately, the armor has to be the person that, you know, that 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 handles that. And, you know, we, we just don't sacrifice that. Uh, one thing which I did get, want to get on to, because uh, I find it's really great in this movie. You tack 
tackle some issues, which I'd say, especially in America, but also here, uh, hot button issues at the moment. So you've got ex-military, which I know the way uh, servicemen are treated post-military in America, especially, is a big thing that's being looked into. Sadly, not enough being done towards. You've got kind of these gangs, which, uh, and the reasons for them seems very important to kind of get into a film like this. Mm -hmm. How do you uh, ensure, ensure ethnicity when these issues are so uh, hot button right now? So, um, you know, I always check with, I have a friend who's like a army ranger. So on that side, um, you know, I would always check in with him about like, you know, what he's going through and, and, you know, here, here's what's happening. Does this feel real to you? Um, and then we had strategic, um, like our stunt team, you know, have former military as far as like strategic movement and those kind of things. So emotionally I, I would go to my friend as a ranger and strategically we relied, you know, with our team on set. And then on the other side of it, man, I grew up in the streets of Memphis, Tennessee. So, like, I know what, like, the cats, like, uh, Leon's character um, and and the other pieces of the puzzle. Like, I've lived that life. I've seen that life. And thank God I was able to, like, not get caught up in that life or or suppressed by that life or killed in that life. Because um, it happens, uh, you know, man, I just look back, man. I just, like, whew, had some close calls, man. So, like, just so thankful, man. Um so, yeah, so I would tap into that and, and, you know, just kind of bring some of my background and and really bring these worlds together. Yeah, and there's also uh, police corruption is dealt within this. And it's one of these maddening issues where it seems those who would be able to tackle it are so defensive towards it that they don't they do not do enough to, to handle it. Uh, do, you, do you anticipate some backlash from that? Because as I say, the, the, it seems the police world can sometimes be so protective of itself. It doesn't admit to and move on from flaws. Yeah, you know, I, I don't know. Um, I, I mean, it's a good question. Could there be? Probably. Um, would there be some people from a certain sect and be like, oh, yeah, you're talking about that. I don't want to have anything to do with it. Sure. Um, I, I have a, a little bit bigger belief in, uh, in our in people, I guess, that the greater number would be like, okay, I see the reasonableness. Oh, I see that this is a story. Oh, I see this is a metaphor um, and not a literal like, hey, this is happening in town X. No, this is a metaphorical piece um, that's wrapped into, you know, an action movie. And um, so, yeah, I, I see that. And I do think just like in general, for some reason, I don't know who or how, but somebody has been successful in positioning um, anti-police equals pro-rights and pro-rights equals anti-police. I don't believe that. I believe like, look, we need law enforcement, period. Like, like yeah. if something happens, I bet I need a good officer that, that can come help. And at the same time, we don't want people in a position of power abusing that power against anybody because we have to trust those people to do their job and do it well because we're entrusting a lot of ourselves and our family with these officers. So it's just like officers should not be like hidden behind this quote unquote blue wall, but behind a wall of we're protecting you by making sure that everybody that's with us is going to do the right thing. Um, and for whatever reason, that common sense, logical approach is, is overlooked for the extreme left and the extreme right. When like neither one of those positions like gets us anywhere in a you know in an advancement state yeah i can agree more i mean i i feel i am pro police but i am pro questioning the police when they get something wrong and there's uh friends of mine i you sort of know when you post something which friends are gonna immediately if it's anything to do with the police go well no blue lives matter this is why this is important it's like <laughs> it's okay to question something and still love it yeah like it, it's not one or the other like you know it, it's there needs to be a, there is a happy medium there uh, for both. Um, and I got, you know, my uh, cousin was a chief of police in Jackson, Tennessee, like, you know, and, you know, I, I, I just I just know there I've, I've seen good officers and I've seen very bad ones of all colors. <laughs> like it's not yeah. it's not a white or just white or black. I've had black officers pull me over like. I'm rushing home one night and like trying to get the girl I was dating, trying to get her home like before curfew. And, you know, so I, I ran a light and then they pulled me over. They put me in handcuffs, searched the whole car. And like, 
And I was just a teenager trying to like not break curfew from somebody. So, you know, and they were black guys and they were mean about it, you know, and I've had Caucasian officers like, you know, give me a warning when I was dead wrong on something be like, all right, you know, so it's just like, you know, I always tease like, you know, um, people are God's greatest creation and it's also God's worst creation. And, you know, we just need to start tapping into the better part of ourselves. And if a little film could help you just open your eyes up just a little bit to somebody just a little bit different. So the next time you encounter them, you know, then it's worth it. I love that. Uh, One thing on a slightly lighter note, which I do love, (laughs) is this is kind of a film which involves getting the band together, getting the crew back together. Mm -hmm. Just it's such a wonderful staple of, of action movies for me. How satisfying is it to do one of those kind of moments? Oh, it was, it's real cool, man. Um, yeah, it's real cool. And then this group of guys with Gianni and Steve and Vernon Davis, the, the former tight end, uh, it was really cool. And uh, it was probably one of the funner, funner pieces um, on it. And um, I wouldn't mind doing it again with them, um, you know, like a prequel, but um, it was cool. It's like really fun, yeah. Yeah, it just seems like one of those moments when if you're gonna do an action film, the moment where the crew gets together just just seems like such a great moment to go yeah. up. <laughs> yep, it is. Uh, one of the things which I mentioned kind of when I sent over the uh, little uh, description about yourself and the work is that something which seems really important to you is the flawed characters. Mm-hmm. Why is that so important to, to see in your films? Well, because we're all like flawed human beings and I really want a level of uh, realism and authenticity in, in the film. And like, I feel like real and complex characters are the ones we can actually relate to and not necessarily fall in love with, but follow (laughs) with the level of empathy. And, you know, I feel like when you, when you see these flawed characters and they, you know, survive their circumstances, it can give just a little bit of hope, you know, on tough days sometimes. I absolutely love that. And uh, so uh, day to day, when is it out? So it came out on March Fourth last Friday is out right now on video on demand, all the iTunes, Apple TV, Vudu, your cable pay per view, and uh, yeah, so it, it's out. You know, I'd love for you to check it out. And what's the next thing for you, Wes? What are you working on next? Yeah, we're in pre production on a film called Three Mile In. Um, it's like a little caper of uh, like a Reservoir Dogs meets Smoking Aces, um, starring Kelly Rowland from Destiny's Child. Wow. Oh, yeah. come on. Destiny's yeah. child. A- action, action star, man. She she's gonna like surprise a lot of people, man. It's gonna be a it's gonna be a blast. I cannot wait to see that. Hopefully you'll come back and talk about it when it comes out. Uh thank you very much for joining us, Wes. It's been a really lovely chat. All right, thank uh, you, man. When this comes up on radio tomorrow, we're doing a Irish theme in celebration of St. Patrick's Day. Do you have any Irish artist you'd like to hear a tune from? Or any tune, we can play anything for you, but if you fancy thing which was the theme. I I don't, um, but I will listen and just pick something in honor of me, and I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna rock with it. Okay, I'll tell you what. Like we'll play a bit of Destiny's Child just for you. It kind of links in nicely here. (laughs) All right, cool, man. (laughs) Thank you very much, Wes. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Very good luck with the uh, the film and for whatever comes next for you. All right, thanks for having me, man. Great chat. Thanks, Wes. Bye. All right, yeah, bye, bye. So that is our double interview for tonight. Please join us tomorrow at 6 p.m. UK time uh, where we're going to be uh, having our St. Patrick's Day special with the interviews with Wes and uh, with my guest earlier from tonight, Dave. And we hope you'll join us. That's sw20radio.co.uk. And if I can find it, we do have a little caption here. sw20radio.co.uk where you can uh, watch that all throughout the world uh thank you very much guys i've been dr squeed that was my show and please remember guys in a world where you can be absolutely anything please be kind <laughs>